pleasure to uh, to welcome you here uh, for what is our uh, penultimate uh, Irish Studies Research Seminar for this semester. Uh, our our speaker this afternoon is is well known to, to Queen's audiences, regular visitor, or at least was before COVID interrupted. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> uh, professor Eugenio Biagini uh, is um, Professor of Modern and Contemporary History at the University of Cambridge and a Fellow of Sydney Sussex uh, College. Uh, he's an alumnus of the Scuola Normale Superiore de Pisa uh, and has been at Cambridge since 1985, a, research, a junior research fellow at Churchill College, uh, then spending two years at the Department of History at Newcastle um, before becoming Assistant Professor of Modern British History at Princeton and returning to Cambridge in 1996 to take up the post of College Lecturer at uh, Robinson College, uh, then becoming a University Lecturer in 1998 and Reader in 2000, moving back to his old college, Sydney Sussex, in 2008. And in 2011, he was appointed to a personal chair and is now a professor of modern and, and contemporary history. And I'm sure uh, everyone is aware, uh, Eugenio has, has published extremely widely uh, on the politics of um, British democracy, Glad Gladstone, um, and particularly its relationship with Irish nationalism in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, he has co-edited uh, with Daniel Mulhall, The Shaping of Modern Ireland, in 2016 and, and co-edited with Mary Daly, The Cambridge Social History of Ireland since 1740 uh, in 2016. And his current research focuses on the history of religious and ethnic minorities in 20th century Ireland in comparative perspective, focusing on the challenge of nation building, the redefinition of public interest, civil liberties and the constitution in deeply divided societies. And it's on an aspect of that research that Eugenio is going to speak to us uh, this afternoon and his title is 1940 to 49 the last stand of the Monaghan Orangeman. Thank you Peter for this very generous introduction and also for inviting me which is um, very much appreciated and thank you to you all and the uh, audience online uh, as well for being here this evening. <clears throat> 100 years ago most of Ireland ceased to be part of the United Kingdom and became the Irish Free State encompassing 26 of the island of the island 32 counties the remaining six counties elected to stay closely associated with britain as a self-governing province of northern ireland partition was ultimately about one issue minorities their oppression real or imagined anticipated or remembered their rights and demands and the way such demands might be reconciled with the territorial integrity of the nation state the adoption of the principle of nationalism and national self-determination on a majoritarian, more or less democratic basis um, brought, brought about both the unmixing of populations and the claim that only the majority ethnic groups within uh, any given country was truly national. Tim Wilson, Robert Gerwarth and Marty Mazauer, among others, have examined the consequences of the new system. At the time, even democratic leaders like Thomas Mazarik, the second slide, if you don't mind, thank you, I have only two slides actually. Thomas Mazarik in 1918 admitted that a precondition for minorities to be tolerated was that they should be neutralized and minimized in numbers. To be more explicit, they needed to be subjugated in the sense described by Calivas, that is made to know that they were not only powerless, but also that any desperate attempt to make trouble will only bring upon them certain destruction. Duly warned by uh, the violence of 1919 to 1923, Southern Protestants accepted the outcome of the revolution and even partition, though the border communities protested against being excluded from the North. The present paper focuses on the internal debate within a highly influential section of the border Protestant, the loyal oral Georgia of County Monaghan, working primarily from the minutes of the meetings for the period between 1940 and 1949. And there are three reasons for this particular strategy. The first is that these minutes have, have survived more or less intact. The second is that it was a period of rapid ex and exceptional change, including the Second World War and they are leaving the Commonwealth. And the third reason 
is the shift in Southern Protestant strategies and identities during this period. Monarch and Orange Men has stood out against the trend <clears throat> towards integration with remarkable resilience during the interwar period, but shared a certain resentment against the North and de facto moved away from their traditional unionist and Orange policies in this period. However, as Terence Dooley has established, even in the immediate after war, uh, aftermath of the um, War of Independence, they were disenchanted with Edward Carson and developed an alternative minority survival strategy. And Brian Walker has examined how this informed a vigorous participation in regional press pressure groups. He has also shown how independent Protestant representatives and representation in the Doyle declined from 1932 to 1948, when only one uh, independent TD survived, William Sheldon from Donegal East. Other Protestants adopted a different strategy. They stood as candidates for either Fine Gael, like Morris and Henry Dockerell, or Fine Foyle, like Lionel Booth in Dan Leary and Eskine Child Childers in uh, Monaghan. In County Monaghan, the key area, the key years to change were the 1940s, which saw a gradual shift away from identity politics towards broader coalitions based on shared economic interests. This was facilitated by a gradual relaxation of religious diversity, of attitudes to religious diversity between 1923 and 1949, with 1935 and the riots standing out as sort of the Yet Southern Protestants had no illusions about the persistent reality of discrimination as opposed to intolerance and persecution. They simply reoriented themselves towards a different strategy, chiefly forms of Christian democracy, looking for common grounds with Catholics on issues such as welfare and social reform. They were partly influenced by developments in the United Kingdom and the United States, and partly by their horror for the threat to Christian values posed by uh, both Nazism and Stalinism. In this paper, I first survey some of these changes in Southern Protestant ideas and rhetoric, and then compare and contrast such developments with the views articulated by the Monaghan uh, Orange Men, um, uh, which were consistently more traditional. Our starting point is the outbreak of the Second World War. Quote, we cannot help being shocked and disappointed that Europe is once again lurking down into the horrors of war. Thus wrote Norma McPherson, minister of York Street Congregational Church in Dublin in October 1939. It is interesting that he thought in terms of Europe rather than the British Empire. And it was not an isolated case among era Protestants. As the war started, there was nothing like the patriotic enthusiasm of 1914. The Valeras resolved to keep the country out of the war, contributing, contributed to muffling the debate. Elizabeth Bowen described that the neutrality is a very popular option in almost all classes, and its popularity is impressive. Southern Protestants felt like an outpost of empire in a rhetorically anglophobic era. The neutrality of the country and the government censorship increased their sense of isolation. As Bedell Stanford reminisced, uh, um, uh, neutrality created a closely nervous atmosphere, which made us all too much inclined to brood on our own insular ills and fears. And the Reverend Charles Caldwell uh, noted in a 1940 sermon delivered at Corlea in County Monaghan, the extreme severity of the censorship stands between us and the facts. Yet about 70,000 Southerners, mostly Catholics, but Protestants were overrepresented in, time, in terms of, um, in proportion to their numbers, joined the British forces. In proportion to other Commonwealth countries of comparable size, Ireland's contribution represented not only a significant number in absolute figures, larger than the South African contingent, but also a considerable proportion of the population higher than the contribution of Australia. It seems that most Irish volunteers had non-political motivations, including economic considerations. It was a time of high unemployment, 
spirit of adventure and family military traditions. Only a few seem to be inspired by a desire to defend democracy or fight fascism. Even fewer were moved by a sense of obligation to the crown. As for censorship, it is not clear that it was as restrictive and effective as it is generally believed. For example, the Church of Ireland Gazette reported on a weekly basis on the situation in Europe and raised funds for the victims of German invasions, adopting an uncomplicated pro-British approach throughout the war. The Irish Times was periodically in trouble, but this was partly because it said it to editor Smilly was often deliberately provocative. Yet Smilly's West Britonism had become a posture in the sideshow. Already in the 1930s, he had positioned the paper as Ireland's main liberal forum. He reckoned that, encompassing both a universal set of values and a domestic cultural tradition, the appeal to liberal democracy could bridge the gap between minority and majority in the way imperial patriotism had done in the spring and summer of 1914. In the 1940s, as Milly turned the war into the opportunity to transform the public perception of the Irish Times from the organ of a dwindling post-unionist faction into the newspaper of a younger and well-educated urban readership, irrespective of religious affiliation. Because the war became more and more ideological, especially from December 1941, when the United States joined the Allies, Praising liberal democracy was an effective way to align era with Britain without even the need to mention the B word. This is important because it reflected a wider process of reorientation of minorities away from Britain, but through British values towards an alternative Ireland. We have noted how the pastor of one of the Dublin congregational congregation, uh, churches uh, described the beginning of the war as a tragedy for European civilization, rather than merely a threat and a challenge to the British Empire. Almost six years later, most of his co-religionists celebrated the end of the war, not as uh, a British and an, an American success, but as a triumph of the United Nations. This triumph of a certain idea of international democracy came with a confidence that the moment for social justice at home had come. As Professor Corky wrote in the Presbyterian Herald, quote, the Beveridge Report is a new charter of equity, a plan for the practice of Christian love in our age. The spirit of sympathy and understanding that animates it is irresistible. Its marshalling of details and principles is masterly. And the balance, and the balance judgment it displays in putting forward its proposal for mitigating the misfortune of the poor, will commend it to all who are in any degree sensible to the tragedy of human need." End quote. In 1945, Brian Harvey, then at Trinity College Dublin, and soon to become a missionary in India, delivered a series of sermons in which he argued that to counteract totalitarianism, the world needed a deep and holistic engagement uh, with democracy, and the church should be in the, fir in the first uh, in the front line. He emphasized the centrality of individual personality in politics and the notion that humanity was best fulfilled when men operated as God's stewards on earth. Similarly, he condemned the idea that business, manufacturing, and the professions should work for profit rather than for the welfare of society, and thought that the Christian church had long let people down by accepting a social theory that enslaved man to economics and which in terms of its theological implications, was nothing less than heresy. In some respects, his ideas parallel those that then articulated by Jacques Maritain, though Harvey did not cite him and was unlikely to be familiar, to have been familiar with his work at the time because it had not been translated yet. It certainly illustrated the compati compat compatibility of Catholic and Protestant pop political thought in the new conditions created by the war and the American occupation of Europe. The trouble with uh, Harvey's Christian democracy was that it did not match the reality of wartime Ireland, where the upper classes hated socialism more than the IRA, 
and dreamt a return to 1913 and were ready to ridicule the nanny state, as it was later called, and beverages, freedoms. Moreover, for all social classes across the spectrum, sectarian considerations continue to matter more than securing social improvement, let alone the welfare state. Even Harvey campaigned to ensure that every Church of Ireland child would be able to attend the Church of Ireland National School, as opposed to the going to a Roman Catholic school and coming under the influence, as he said, alien to the teaching of our communion. And on the other hand, on the other side of the fence, in 1943, as the UK was in the process of implementing the beverage report, Archbishop McQuaid and De Valera were in correspondence about ways to circumscribe non-Catholic participation in the Commission on Youth Unemployment. While the episode was not known at the time, the consequences of the relative frame of mind were, were evident and resented by liberal intellectuals of all religious persuasions. To Christabel Billenberg, De Valera's discriminatory piety and was self-delusional hypocrisy. An Anglo-Irish aristocrat who had um, uh, lived in Germany through the war, she believed that Catholics and Protestants should work together for a better future, as they had done in Germany during the resistance. Could civil society trump sectarianism? In his 1944 essay, A Recognized Church, Stanford repeated the usual claims of Irish Protestants to their historic contribution to Ireland. He claimed that in this they were similar to Protestant in France and even the Waldensian Protestants in Northern Italy, which was an interesting uh, parallel or comment to make, which aided, uh, that aimed at deflecting suspicions of West Britonism, under which had been for a long time, of course. Yet he complained about sectarian pressures and discrimination. Casual sectarianism, he said, was like old racism, another significant comparison in the context of the time. Like racism, sectarianism operated anothering approach based on prejudice. Likewise, both Gaelic nationalism and Dorangism were for him forms of racial exclusivism. Stanford was quite despondent about the minorities' prospects in the South, noting a growing sense of alienation and the impression that we, uh, the Protestants had only two sensible courses to follow, imitate the chameleon or leave the country. He caused some debate in his, um, and this most uh, stringent uh, critic of Erlein um, in uh, the Bell magazine uh, under an article entitled Tourism in Trinity, uh, described his stance as a, um, one looking back at the past claiming that equal rights were not enough in lamenting lost privileges, hence the title of the response. He argued that Stanford seemed to be concerned about his commun community as Protestants, not as citizens, and suggested that they should muscle, muscle in along the lines of the Legion of Mary and the Gaelic League, increasing their visibility and asserting the right to be heard. Instead, he said, what Stanford argued for was like complaining that Ireland had long been locked into the sacristy and wishing for air to be locked up occasionally in the vestry of Christ Church or the crypts of St. Michael's. In other words, the fallen saw Stanford as implying that equality before the law was not possible, the citizenship was not enough, and the rights uh, should be entrenched in uh, and the rights should be entrenched in all in all privileges. Duly castigated. In 1946, Stanford published Faith and Faction in Ireland Today, in which he decried sectarian politics and praised the 1937 constitution. He concluded by proposing a Christian democratic alternative to Offerland's secularism, asserting the need of, uh, for, of religion in politics in order to encourage a full sense of one's duty to man as well as to God, a prophetic vision that um, can see above the past and the present and the charity that includes and goes beyond justice, he said. The debate ended with what looked like a vindication of the liberal democratic character of the South, but the evidence was more complex. In the same issue of the Bell, of Hollande published a mini survey asking six Protestants whether they had experienced any sectarian pressure. 
of these three, the Bishop of Limerick, the Rector of St. George's in Dublin, and the Quaker public moralist Arnold Marsh, said that they did indeed experience uh, pressure. The playwright Lennox Robinson denied any personal experience of sectarian pressure, but contradicting himself, added that Catholic attempts to proselytize him made him an even blacker Protestant. Helen Chenevix of the Women's, of the women's um, Workers' Union said that among trade union members, there was no religious discrimination because of class solidarity. And Lil Nick Dunkada, the principal of uh, Coleste Moitai, the Protestant teacher's uh, training college, argued that if only Protestants would learn the Irish language, they would find that the national language created a bond stronger than religion, enabling them to become real fellow citizens. She admitted, however, that in the Archdiocese of Dublin, the Catholic hierarchy was so obviously anti-Protestant that it scarcely needs to be mentioned. In practice, then, all of them acknowledged that there was indeed discrimination, though some argue that it could be ameliorated by special countervailing influences. This claim must have come across as rather unconvincing to most readers, um, though not to the editor, who chose to believe that the six uh, simply disagreed on with one another. The idea that religious grievances should not be resented in a democracy or should not be allowed to affect overarching national identities simply ignore the reality of the times. Not only in Ireland, but also in Italy, France and Spain, religious discrimination was again a battlefield for Democrats and liberals. The secular state, the laicite that Ophelen advocated, was nothing more than in itself another essentially religious option. So what about Monaghan? In the three border counties, there still survived a different form of Christian involvement in politics, one built around the orange lodges. The latter, in, associa in association with local church leaders, had long been able to return their independent TDs. The alliance was apparently strengthened from 1943 by Richard Tyner, the new bishop of Cloher. Um, whose diocese included most of Hermana in Monaghan and parts of Cavan, Littrim, and Donegal. Originally a Westmeath man, Tyner was more than an ordinary brother. He was a grand officer of the Grand Lodge and also of the Royal Black Preceptory and an active member of the Protestants Association and indeed of a number of voluntary committees in County Monaghan. Yet his episcopal election did nothing to stem the decline of Protestant representation in the area. One key factor was the fall in the number of Protestant uh, voters. Moreover, as Monaghan uh, TD Alexander Hazlett himself pointed out, another important cause was the apathy and contrariness of some of our people. Could this be reversed at the forthcoming general election? Uh, Haslett hoped that for every loyal orangeman in the county to be up and doing and see that they were available, that every available Protestant voter comes to the poll, but admitted that success required a Catholic transfer of votes, which might be forthcoming, he thought, because they hated us less than they hate each other, and they may give us subsequent preferences. This being the case, it is remarkable that Haslett did not go out of his way to appeal to Catholic uh, voters. As deputy Grand Master, he stood in the interest of Protestantism in this county, county and given his championing of proportional representation, which de Valera was threatening to end, was coached in terms of defending primarily the interests of the religious minority. By contrast, the other independent candidate, James Dillon, son of the Victorian home ruler, Though a Catholic was careful to adopt issues which would appeal to the Protestant voter, as well as to Catholics, with, um, with his emphasis on farmers' profits, his opposition to errors neutrality in the war, and his hostility to teaching through the medium of Irish, which he described as an outrage on children. On polling day, the 23rd of June 1943, Hazlitt was not successful, and though various arguments were put forward to explain his defeat, such as the want of motor transport, the Grand Lodge admitted that it was quite clear that a substantial number of those 
um, or whom we were entitled to look for their support, have failed in their duty. This means that the sectarian loyalties had, were declining faster than the number of Protestants in the area. The Orange Order had expected to mobilize up to 6,000 votes. Hasler secured fewer more than, few more than 5,000 votes against 5,400 for Dillon, who was duly elected. In Cavan, John Dole, also an orange man, was successful, but in Donegal East, Major Miles lost his seat, though William Sheldon kept his. Though Hazlitt insisted on the great responsibility uh, the teach orange men had in the upholding and safeguarding of Protestant principles, he did not stand again at the elections of either 1944 or 1948. No Protestant candidate was elected for the constituency and Dillon continued to top the poll. Another area uh, of uh, diversity between North and South, apart, the, apart, apart from the strategy in approaching elections and, pro and, pre and Protestant representation, was the response to neutrality. While, as we have seen, most of Southern Protestants emphasized the international democratic crusade argument behind the war, on Victory in Europe Day, Michael Knight, the long-serving Grand Master of Monaghan, issued an uncompromisingly partisan appeal uh, about uh, appraisal of what the war had been about. He denounced Hera's neutrality as, quote, dictated by their hatred of England as a Protestant nation, a policy which made it 26 counties an outcast in the eyes of the world and did a great injustice to the loyal people whose sympathy and support uh, was for the empire and the allies. Victor in Europe, the Grand Master argued for Protestant voters to mobilize themselves in the approaching local elections with a view to securing the election of as many orange men as possible. The Deputy Grand Master Hazlitt argued that as upholders of Protestant principles, Monaghan orange men should take heart and of courage that the arrogant dictator of Barbaros uh, dictatorship of barbarous leaders, Hitler and Mussolini, brought up in the Church of Rome and backed by it until it was seen that their defeat was certain, are now defeated." End quote. However, was not this approach already becoming obsolete even in Monaghan? In launching Hazlitt's 1943 candidature, Michael Knight had opined that in the eyes of Protestants in the other can the, sorry, the eyes of Protestants in the other counties are upon us. If they were, this was not exactly to imitate the handling of minority interest in politics which the orange men of this county were adopting. In fact, it was becoming increasingly clear that um, rebuilding the, the, the protection of Protestant interest in the South required the building of broad and cross-confessional alliances rather than relying on denominational solidarities. Far from representing the future, Monaghan stood for a past which could not be recovered. Southern Protestants had long resented Northern Irish Unionists, including Carson. They wasted no love on his successor, Lord Craig Avon. When he died in 1940, the Church of Ireland Gazette provided a dismissive and unforgiving obituary. He described Craig Avon as a typical Irishman, his firmness of character being nothing more than immovable stubbornness. This, the Gazette continued, con does not make Lord Craig Avon any less representative of the Irish political mind, or at least of that northern variety of the stubbornness, which, to our great hurt, has driven the relations of one part of our country to the other into the thoroughly unwholesome and deplorable state in which we find it today. Craig Avon's priority was to prevent what he regarded as the frightful doom of incorporation into an independent Ireland. Quote, in order to banish this spectre, he pursued towards the considerable nationalist minority of the North, a policy calculated to emphasize as much as possible the difference between his own outlook and theirs and much of his legislation was of a kind to cause uneasiness in liberal English circles. 
a policy of tolerance and understanding might have given a lead to the country and assisted in bringing into existence an Ireland independent politically, but adhering to loyally to the Commonwealth connection, enjoying its advantages and shouldering its responsibilities. But Lord Craig Avon was not a statesman of the calibre of Kevin O'Higgins. O'Higgins, who was assassinated on his way to Mass in 1927, was remembered for his firm line against the IRA and in favour of the Commonwealth. He was seen to stand for a form of political Christianity, which, although of the Roman kind, was inclusive and national and was compatible with imperial loyalism. Monaghan Protestants had long been experiencing the consequences of Craig Avon's alternative the alternative strategy of partition. And they too, despite the professed admiration for the late unionist leader and his predecessor, were critical of his policies. The county grandmaster, Grant Michael Knight, could not forgive that when partition came, in order to make Northern Ireland a safe uh, Protestant jurisdiction, the Ulster Unionist Council had voted out Cavan, Donegal and Monaghan in violation of the terms of the 1912 Covenant. Inevitably, Knight continued, this created a very bitter feeling among our people, whose representatives had never joined the Aster Unionist Council again. We had been cut off against our will, not, and notwithstanding our protest, and from thence onward, our political connection ceased, even in 1943, when they were approached with a renewed invitation to send representatives to Belfast, they declined to nominate delegates. Yet some border county orangemen had not abandoned the hope of eventual annexation to the north. In May 1945, in the context of the VE euphoria, the Ferrag Lodge wrote to the Monaghan Grand Lodge, urging that some active movement uh, should be put on foot with the object of bringing the three counties into the area of Northern Ireland and taking them from under the control of the Irish Free State. Sick. Michael Knight provided the, a long and detailed answer. He started by admitting that the restoration of the, of the three counties of the province of Ulster and their incorporation into Northern Ireland had his full sympathy, but immediately added that one must face up the realities to the realities to realize that the position you must go back some years to when the partition arrangements were agreed. At the time, Sir Edward Carson and his supporters in Ulster resolved to treat the solemn legal covenant, quote, as a scrap of paper. And of course, it was alluding to the infamous 1914 description of the treaties protecting Belgian neutrality. At the Ulster Unionist Council meeting, Carson's supporters indulged in propaganda of all kinds in the press and on the platform and by personal canvas of the delegates and dismissed the three counties case for an unpartitioned Ulster. And this takes us to another dimension, which was particularly embarrassing during the war, the issue of re the residence permit. During the war, the residence permit of the residence permit policy adopted by Stormont um, for Southern Protestants became an issue of contention. It turned out to be very, very important, embarrassing for both for St Stormont and for the Grand Lodge uh, of Ireland, as well as, for, as of course, as for Monaghan, the other two counties. In 1944, the Grand Lodge of County Leitrim passed a, a resolution to express their disappointment about the injustice received by our Protestant population at present resident in Northern Ireland in regard to residential permits. When Monaghan received a copy, they wrote to the Grand Lodge of Ireland in Belfast, reminding them of the promises made by our great leader, the, the late Lord Craig Avon, the Southern Protestants will always find a home in Northern Ireland. They argued that now it is the time to carry out this promise into effect and that the policy of your government should be not only to welcome, but also to assist all Protestants in era to take up residence and become loyal citizens of Northern Ireland, end quote. Instead, the, the opposite was happening, end quote. It is most difficult and painful for us to understand why the Northern government should cast uh, 
them out as undesirable or as unwelcome and unwanted guests, end quote. The apparently bizarre exclusion was discussed in great detail at a meeting of the Grand Lodge of Ireland attended by both the Northern Ireland Prime Minister and his immediate uh, predecessor. The Grand Master explained that they had come up against a regulation which could not be amended and that all they could do was to handle work permit applications from Southern Protestants on a case-by-case -case basis. The restriction on immigrants had originated at the beginning of the war, but was inspired by the 1935 riots, which were caused, the Grand Master claimed, by the presence of so many Roman Catholics on Queen's Island and in other shipyards, quote, to prevent the recurrence of similar incidents and to enable our service members to obtain employment on their return when hostilities ceased, a regulation was made by the Home Minister, Mr. Morrison, at the request of Brother the Right uh, Honourable J. M. Andrews, who was then Prime Minister. The regulation was made under the defence of the Real Act. This regulation compelled all persons who came from ERA or elsewhere to register for employment and to make application for a residence permit, end quote. He added that our government cannot discriminate between Protestant and Roman Catholic in view of the divergent opinions on the other side of the channel, and that it was unfair to say that only Protestants were being sent back to error. Roman Catholics were being sent back in hundreds. Andrews, who was present, confirmed that this was indeed the situation. Another speaker, Brother Robert Armstrong Jr., said that only era orangemen should be included in the matter of permits because, quote, some of era Protestants were as disloyal as the IRA, end quote. The Prime Minister, Sir Basil Brooke, then outlined the principles of the permit. As long as an unemployed resident of Northern Ireland of a particular trade was available, no outsider would be brought in, end quote. The situation was altogether extraordinary. There is some evidence that Jewish refugees from continental Europe wishing to immigrate to Belfast could be excluded if they had Catholic connections. But now a similar fate expected Southern Protestants wishing to make Aliyah into the Protestant promised land. If their unionist credentials were less than impeccable, they would be excluded. Whatever Alexander Hazlitt thought, it was hard for Southern Ulster Orangemen to resign themselves to being treated as aliens in their beloved Protestant province. At the end of 1945, the County Cavan Grand Lodge requested the Grand Lodge of Ireland to take all necessary steps to safeguard the rights of Orangemen who are domiciled or citizens, domiciled in or citizens of ERA. Once again, the resolution invoked Craig Avon's promise the Northern Ireland would always be a refuge for them and they would always be assisted and welcomed there. Instead, now they had been thrown to the wolves. The Grand Master, uh, Sir Joseph Davison, said a sum of four or five hundred permits had been renewed and this was as far as the government could go. The Prime Minister, Sir Basil Brook, who attended the meeting, agreed. The fact was that, quote, today men were returning from the services and this man would have to be reinstated by their former employers. A socialist government in London would hardly countenance any change in the existing conditions. Even as it was, the returning servicemen were not getting employment, end quote. The Grand Master admitted that, quote, Alto Craig Gavon has said he would welcome era Protestant. Six years of bitter world war has since taken place and aspects of many things had much changed. End quote. Breden south of the border had to adapt. With the electoral vigor much diminished and once again abandoned by the northerners, lodges in Cavan, Donegal and Monaghan had to revise their strategies. The surviving minutes of their meetings suggested their main concern was now not to reassert Protestant power, but to prevent a further slide into the direction of a more integrated society. Debates uh, focus on uh, mixed marriages, this is how to avoid them, and on at least one occasion on how to prevent Catholics from attending functions in both Orange Halls 
and church and Protestant church halls. And it is interesting that Catholics wish to attend functions in orange halls. Yet the wartime elections had already shown that the ethnic platform was no longer politically viable. And in November 1946, Monaghan orange men started to change their electoral rhetoric, quote, we represent the culture and the largest rate pay taxpayers and own substantial property in this county. We should be an example as law abiding citizens and let our light so shine before men that they would see our good works. This was one of their declarations in the run up to local elections. In other words, they were now adopting an approach close to the one long espoused by other Southern Protestants who sought to retain influence not through religious political separatism, but by building a common platform with the middle classes from other social and, and religious backgrounds. If there was confusion within uh, the orange um, policies of this period, part of the problem seems to have been a contrast between generations. When in 1947, the Monaghan Grand Lodge launched a subscription among its members to buy a wedding present for Princess Elizabeth, the Grand Master expressed concern that, quote, he did not find the same enthusiasm in young men now as in the past. And unfortunately, there are many who are false to the principles of Protestantism. He said that if the Protestant Association should decide to put forward a candidate, he, the candidate, must have uh, the wholehearted support from his own people. But if Protestants don't vote for the Protestant candidate, he shows up as he shows us up in a very bad light. He then asked for a free expression of opinion, and the deputy grand master addressed the meeting and said that all the members were inclined to live in the past, but young people wanted to know what we are going to do for the future. A lot of them remember nothing on 1921, and, and we as County Grand Lodge have to turn our face to the sun and tell them what we stand for, an open Bible and civil and religious liberty, end quote. He urged those present, and especially the clergy, to use all the influence they had to bring young Protestant men into the rank of Orangism. He then referred to the repeal of the External Relations uh, Act. Um, uh, was there actually a bill not yet been passed, but was, was going through the Doyle and lamented that there had been no resistance from the Protestant churches. The repeal of the External Relations Act was nevertheless a blow for Monaghan Orangemen. In May 1949, for the first time, Michael Knight adopted the rhetoric of Christian resignation that his more Southern co colleagues had already been using for the past 20 years. Quote, there is a power which ordains, ordains all things, which seem to him best, sorry, uh, there is a power which ordereth all things which seem to him best. And if we stand fast to our principles, uh, evidenced by our daily lives and our dealing with our fellow men, we can wield a silent but whistle and beneficial influence in the community in which we live. It was almost a paraphrasis of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 5, which had been long invoked by Archbishop Greg and many others in outlining the new policy of Southern Protestants after partition. Knight then asked Brother Hazlitt to speak on the subject of a possible reunification of Ireland. And Hazlitt said, it has always been a puzzle to me to understand upon what foundation the claim rests that only a section of people can call themselves Irishmen and the rest has included Sudeten Germans. Any early history I've read tells me that the ancient Hibernians were a mixed population made up of descendants of emigrants from Phoenicia, Spain, Gaul, and Scandinavia, added to, added to later by colonists from England, Scotland, and many other parts of the world. Truly a homogeneous crowd. It is rather interesting to examine the genealogy of Mr. De Valera, Robert Briscoe, Count Plunkett, and other leaders today. Well, 
we will arrive at the conclusion that to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church is the chief qualification of a professed Irish patriot, and the definition of a citizen as set out in the Constitution is disregarded. In short, by 1949, uh, Hazlitt and uh, others within the, the Monaghan Grand Lodge invoked a non-ethnic, non-sectarian Irishness and religious freedom as the uh, cornerstones for any possi possible conversation about possible Irish reunification. And this brings us to the conclusion. Victory in Europe marked a turning point because it was achieved not primarily by British imperial power, by, by, but by US-led coalition, um, international coalition, and was followed by a dramatic turn towards decolonization. There was a widespread sense that the world had changed. There were still reasons to admire and look up to Britain, but they were now different. London did not stand any longer for the worldwide empire within which minorities were protected and fostered. Instead, they became a model of democratic social planning, a welfare state which could alternatively be seen as the triumph of a Christian utopia or and the bulwark against communism or a socialist nightmare. In this strange new world, independent Ireland was no longer an experiment. Instead, it was a permanent feature, a permanent feature of the Cold War world. No longer a preposterous anomaly, but a pioneer of decolonization. The question was what to make of it, where to go from here, how to face at long last a post-imperial world. Ireland Usher, uh, put it, as Ireland Usher put it in 1949, before 1916, Ireland was regarded as a mad country in a civilized world. Today, she may be considered a relatively healthy and hopeful country in an increasingly mad world, a state free from social, racial, or ideological strife. Nevertheless, in Monaghan, Orange men continued to look at the North rather than the South, even when the interests of, our, of other Protestants were at stake. For example, there is no mention in the minutes of the Federal Sea Boycott in 1957, which is quite surprising because the echo it was given in the Northern press was considerable. They, uh, the, the Grand Lodge um, tried to retire a policy of rapprochement with, with Monaghan. In 1949, the Grand Master for the first time ever visited Monaghan, and there was a, a later visit in the 1950s. Um, at the election in uh, or the, the Doyle election in 1951 and 1954, James Haslett, son of Alexander, uh, stood again as an independent Protestant candidate, securing 17% of the vote, but was defeated while Dillon um, uh, topped uh, the, the poll. Michael Knight was still the Grand Master, described the result as satisfactory when looked at from the right angle because our object in contesting these elections for the Doyle has always been, above all, to hold our people together by giving them an opportunity or recording their votes for a candidate of their own who goes to the polls on, in their interest and with the object of asserting in a tangible manner they claim to a share in the representation of the county as an important section of the community who had a large share in the welfare of the country generally. There were no, no full stop or no commas here, sorry. On the basis of proportional representation, it continued, which at all events in theory contemplates the representation for minorities. I can conceive of no minority better or indeed as well, in, as, as well entitled to representation as the Protestant in this country. County. Nevertheless, independent Protestant representation was not tried again. There was a future for Protestant candidates in Monaghan, but he went through representation to the other, to the other parties, primarily Fine Gael, uh, up to the present day, of course, with Heather Humphreys describing herself as a proud Ulster woman, a Protestant, and an Irish Republican. Thank you. <laughs>
Great. Um, well, Eugenio, thank you, you so much for that uh, fascinating um, presentation. Um, we can take questions both from the room and also from people online. So if you're online and would like to ask a question, uh, what you need to do is just to press the hand icon uh, on your screen. And that will indicate um, that you want to want to do so. Um, let's throw it open to the floor. So do we have any questions either from the room or online? Who wants to start? Sam. Start. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, when you were doing your research, did you consider gerrymandering was one of the issues, such as uh, the 1941 uh, Local Government Act, which actually reduced the number of sizes for local government seats for the county councils? Like, for example, and also not just the seat total, but for the Monaghan instance, the districts have changed as well. So like Clonus, for instance, had seven seats. So the local partisan association could wield up to two or three candidates and get them from two or ten. Afterwards, though, it dropped down to four, so nearly half, so they could only do one seat. And the same for the, the, the Darwin. That was uh, uh, during as well from the 1960s. So one hand included Louth. And Cavan dropped from four seats to three, and Donegal in included less of the Lagan Valley, which was less than half the vote. So was Jeremy being a factor? But in Donegal was clearly a factor and was uh, uh, complained about because it determined the career of the dependent um, uh, TD in 1961 after many, many years of service. But interestingly enough, there is no reference to gerrymandering in the minutes of the orange um, or the morning of orange order. Instead, there are, as, as you really noticed, there are continuous references to Protestants not voting for the Protestant candidate and for and, and complaining about them not joining the, the order anymore in the same numbers as before. Not to mention the sorrow they, 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 they feel a Catholics turning up at orange hall events, presumably dances and similar. Social events, but nevertheless, it was a you know it was a, a a boundary which was supposedly not to be crossed, and they did. So class basically is trumping religious affiliations. Okay, uh, maybe I can ask a question, yes. Eugenio. I mean, what role, if any, do the Protestant gentry or the surviving Protestant gentry in the county continue to play in politics. I mean, obviously there's the Shirley's at Glasslaw who take a particular pathway, a distinct pathway in this period. Uh, but I mean, do the, are there any other surviving gentry families who play a leadership role in, in any way through to this period? Well, if they do, they're not visible. Um, and of course, um, the, the problem was uh, whatever role you played had to be done through the mechanisms of uh, the democracy and the system of proportional representation, which was so intriguing and also so complicated to operate. So it required a huge amount of expertise rather than patronage, and also a huge amount of, uh, well, the ability to build up um, alliances and mobilize, bring out the Protestant vote, rather than simply rely on the prestige of um, grand uh, names. Thank you. Um, Marie? I'm just wondering about the question of um, the very low level of Protestant involvement in politics at national level generally. I mean, I'm even here mentioning Heather Humphreys in court for her, there's Seymour Crawford. But that, that first doll that Seymour Crawford was elected to, I think it was that uh, 92 election. I'm not sure he might have been the only Protestant elected to the doll. Like, I'm open to correction of that. But you did, Three members of the Jewish congregation in that doll. You had one uh, Muslim from Clare. Uh, just generally, there has been a very low level of Protestant um, involvement at the doll level. Now, I think the abolition of the, the Irish Free State Senate certainly was a low to Protestant representation. But I'm just wondering, generally, apart from things like maybe ger gerrymandering or not people not voting for the Protestant candidate or not coming up through the county councils. Is is that are, are those the main reasons, or do Protestants in the new state tend to sort of veer more towards business, uh, towards economic interests? I'm just I'm not sure. The point you just made is is widely cited in sources, and of course there is a, a long period, um, especially from the 60s, when uh, uh, Protestants simply become less involved in politics, uh, for a while at least. 
but the decline starts with the rise of peony foil, which made con elections much more competitive. And the other consideration is the continued, the various redraft, as you were saying, the various changes in in, in boundary, in, in, in constituency boundaries. Um, competitiveness in elections made the effectiveness of pressure groups such as the Protestant Association much less so and much less effective and also required the creation of broader alliances which would be incorporated or prepared to work with the existing parties. So effectively made politics a more complicated game than it had been until 1932. And of course, the Constitution of 37, the abolition of the Senate, as it has been before, uh, alienated or created a sense of alienation among cross sections of, 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 of the ordinary process. Although the immediate response in 37, especially the election of uh, Douglas Hyde, was relief rather than despondency. Relief that there was a recognition for them and relief that they uh, first protest, the first president was a Protestant, and a certain sense had been listened to in the drafting of the Constitution. Um, the, the Rome rule period starts really from 1949, which is actually what Childers and Mongardas complained about in a prime, in officially, of course, he had a good Fine Foil person, he would say everything was fine and this was the most democratic country in the world. But in private, more than once, twice at least, to um, correspondence, he admitted that Protestants were seriously discriminated against from 1949. And what, what really explains this turn towards, I say, Rome rule, but in fact, it is, it, it was a, a highly Irish version of Catholicism, was on the one hand, the obsession with communism, Cold War, uh, the fear that any, you know, anybody departing from Catholic truth was obviously a communist, including the Baptist, it is a remarkable um, item in the papers on McQuaid, uh, indicating that she suspected Baptist preachers to be communist agitators. So this was one thing. <laughs> and the other thing was that <laughs> Fine Foyle's domination ended and the elections became much more contested. So the alter alterna alterna alter alternating between coalition and Fine Foyle meant that marginal votes were much more important, and priests were important, Catholic priests were very useful in mobilizing the marginal votes. So both Fine Foyle and Fine Gael and the other parties tried to appeal to Catholic influence as much as they could, and the consequence was that politics in the South became much more sectarian for, for a long period. Yes. Like else. Yeah. And Thomas Johnson, actually, former leader, complained about it. So the, the, basically the mechanism of democracy, in many cases, is not works against liberalism, so to speak. And democracy simply means rule to the people and people have, you know, all sorts of prejudices, whatever they are, this prejudice will be empowered. Okay, I'm going to go to, to Dominic, uh, who's been waiting to ask a question online. So over to you. Eugenio, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right there? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I'm going to I'm going to ask the question that everybody there might expect me to ask about um, the centre citizenship and parading. And I wonder how much in the when you looked at the uh, uh, Orangeman in in Monaghan who had come under a great deal of pressure in the 1930s over their ability to parade and when they can parade and that sort of thing. And since since you know the the ability to to parade is is you know taken as an experience of citizenship, it makes a difference to how you feel. I wonder by the 1940s whether that was impinging upon their attitudes in any way or whether there had been any changes. Does it, does it come in the minutes? Does it come through that sense of, of a restricted citizenship in any, any sort of way? Many thanks. In case you've not heard because the voice was not projecting very well, this is a question about the, um, the right to, well, the, the ability to parade. Of course, they had the right to parade in theory, but parades in the South have been discontinued uh, with the exception of one, one case in, in County Donegal, um, it is discussed in the minutes quite fr frequently, and it is indicated as one of the reasons why young people, young men, mm. don't join the Orange Order anymore. So uh, apparently this was well, a recruiting opportunity, and of course many of these parades were like um, like um, country country feasts, if they were in the open air, would have been uh, 
uncontroversial uh, until the 1930s and had been opportunities for, for, for the order to display the numbers and colors and what have you. When this ceased, it apparently initiated a decline which could not be, well, it was not reversed. But interestingly, it's not mentioned as one of the limitations to citizenship rights. In fact, the notion of citizenship is only brought into eminence um, in, around 1949. I may, I, I shall go through my notes again, but I don't think the expression really recurs. Until then, they are really proud to look at Northern Ireland, or rather the British Empire, not, not so much in Northern Ireland, to be honest. The British Empire as the, 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 the place of which they should be and they would like to be citizens of. And victory in Europe is the you know, apex of this particular trend. But citizenship, um, having said so, in the 1920s, Haslett actually was the first to encourage Monaghan um, Orange men to take part in the Irish Free State. Whether he used the notion of citizenship I should be, um, uh, I should be, so basically I would think, it would seem to my, from what I remember, citizenship comes up in the 20s and again in the late 40s, but not in between, which may suggest a connection between citizenship and the sense of crisis. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks Dominic. Sam, you got another one? I was just, just going to ask, did you see in your research any kind of rise in membership in the Orange Order after the Second World War? Like, for example, I've seen in St. Johnston, the Royal Orange Lodge, they had about 74 members in 1939, and then 1945 they increased to 80, and then 1946 increased to 89. So I'm wondering, is that an exception to the rule, or was the part of the pattern that, that some lodges saw a rise in the membership? Interestingly, uh, interesting what you say. I, I don't really know. I should check the sources on this matter across, um, across the, the South. Um, I suppose the real problem was this long-term decline in the number of Protestants and the fact uh, that the Protestants were there were increasingly worried about material issues rather than, than, um, uh, rather than uh, uh, um, identity issues. Yes. Maria again. Still a quick question, sort of linked to Sam as well, and what you're saying about the generational shifts. And I'm wondering about the view, this first generation of young, mostly male Protestants who are born after independence. I'm just wondering about education. Are they educated locally at Monaghan Collegiate or are they still going to boarding schools? Like there would have been a lot of, well, particularly uh, boarding schools even going to Methodist places. They, they would have continued to go to Wesley in Dublin. So I'm just wondering where is education a factor and that they're being really been educated to be Irish citizens, even if they are going to the Protestant schools? I can't answer the question because all I, I, the cases I know are purely anecdotal. Hazlitt, for example, was not was educated locally, although he remains a strong supporter of orangeism. Um, it, it, there is a class is a hugely important issue in, um, and in among Southern Protestants, uh, among Northern Protestants as well, but especially in the South. And it makes a huge difference with school you go to in terms of orientation and in terms of um, uh, identity. But in most cases, Irishness for Protestants is not a problem in the South. It is simply a country rather than a nation. So it's a country in the same way as Scottishness is something the Scots can be proud of, but they're not for the same, and not for that reason, separatists. Um, uh, of course, a particular, particularly important consideration was that the empire provided until until the 1960s provided a, a major source of, of opportunities of employment, and the rise I refer to the large proportion of southerners serving the British forces in the Second World War. Well, the number the number of southerners joining the colours increased well before the war. And this seems to suggest that um, economic factors were important. For them, and probably not even for Catholics or nationalists, it was not necessarily a problem to join the forces, to join the British forces. It was simply one thing that which your father used to do, and your grandfather as well, 
And if there is nothing better to do, you're prepared to do so again. And there are many benefits which come with that. Um, so um, this Irishness education to citizenship is, is, a, is a more complicated issue than it looks unless you are really in a, in a nationalist, in the nationalist tradition. Okay, I'm going to take a question from Karen online. Go ahead. Oh, hello. Hello. Sorry. Can you hear me okay? Karen, yeah. Karen yes. Yeah. So um, I'm wondering if there's a difference between Monaghan um, at that time, and you mentioned also certain um, politicians from, the, from South Dublin, um, Dunleary area, which is where I grew up, by the way. So <laughs> that's why I'm interested. And it seems the picture you've painted is is kind of very different to what I would have um, understood growing up in Dunleary in that, you know, there wasn't really any sense of any discrimination against Protestants. I, I, I went to a Protestant school. I grew up in a community that was mixed, Catholic and Protestant. Um, and the, the senior school part was, was also mixed. Um, but, you know, if, there were tough times, obviously, we're talking about sort of after 1969 and the Troubles era, it was tough times economically, but you were much more likely to get a job if you were Protestant than if you were a Catholic. <laughs> to, to, you know, this is anecdotal, but this is my experience growing up that, you know, if you wanted a job in Grafton Street in a shop as an 18 year old, you were much more likely to get it with a nice Protestant South Dublin accent. Uh, you know, so I, I don't know, I don't really recognize. And also then I'm wondering about Erskine Childers, uh, who was the president, wasn't he? Wasn't you, you mentioned him, wasn't he, um, wasn't he Protestant as well? Uh, and I certainly noticed, by the way, just anecdotally, <laughs> as I was uh, on a tour of the Liberal Club in London, that there were books by Erskine Childers on the bookshelves of the Liberal Club, and they said he was quite um, instrumental in, in the thinking of, of the Liberal Party in England. And, and I was sort of trying to remember, was it, what did who did people vote for? I know there wasn't a huge amount of favour for necessarily Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael, but I do remember a lot of enthusiasm for the progressive Democrats. So, you know, I don't know what my question is exactly, but it's really, you know, is there a difference between that particular situation in Monaghan and the rest of the country, or particularly the independent Republic of Dunleary? <laughs> it's a very good question and, and a very complex one. I should start from, from the end. There was a section of the paper which I cut off because it was, the paper was just too long, concerning the correspondence between Childers and um, uh, a, pres a Methodist minister who um, in, at the end of the war had tried to uh, put together um, a, um, um, a pamphlet um, about the future of Ireland and whether there would be a future um, um, possibility for unification and the, what each community thought about it. And he asked the Catholic and the, and the Protestant, and the Protestant was Childers. So obviously Childers was a person to go to if you wanted a liberal voice in, in, in Protestant circles and you were interested in some, somehow encouraging this particular perception. The problem with Childers, as with many other people who were in democratic politics, is that if you wanted to go ahead in politics, you had to tour the party line. So basically, he had to turn himself into an obedient and uh, disciplined Fine Foyle member in his public utterances. What he says in private is sometimes different. Uh, in this correspondence, which I, I, I was planning to, to use and which I eventually I cut off, um, he, he, there is an interesting example of this particular strategy because he was there trying to put pressure on the Methodists to shift the liturgy towards a more inclusive a Republican liturgy um, in giving thanks uh, and praying for the authorities of uh, Dublin rather than for the King Emperor. And, and, um, and of course, this said a, a follow up in, uh, after the repeal of the, of the other repeal of the External Relations Act. Um, so what I'm, what I'm saying is that there are uh, several levels at which people speak. Employment, I uh, obviously belong to a, a different generation and, uh, and a much younger generation in all possible ways from the people I'm, I'm, writing, uh, I'm, I'm writing about. Possibilities of employment for this generation, the pre-war generation, the wartime generation in 1950s, 
was usually defined along sectarian lines. So yes, Crafton Street in in in, in Protestant shops, but not in, in Catholic ones. And the civil service and the um, and in the and the Garda and the army, um, except with the exception of a few individuals who were there to escort the, the, the president to the Republic when he was not a Catholic, um, were predominantly Catholic. And there was a, uh, there was a, there was a tendency, in fact, among Protestants to withdraw from from these particular services, of which, fortunately, well, I think we've moved on from from those days. Um, where the monogam is stands out, yes, it does stand out. Even in 1912, Dan Leary was not quite a republic, but it was uh, one of the areas when the idea, where the idea of um, a covenant style uh, mobilization was dismissed as altogether impossible. And in most of the South, the whole idea of the covenant, that is of separation or separating Protestants from the Catholics, was unworkable for the simple fact that Protestants relied on their Catholic customers or laborers or neighbors for just about every every activity, you know, from from operating your shop or your farm to just keeping peace, law and order in the in, in, in the area. So basically partition only makes sense where you have rather than a minority, a society which is divided between between factions, between two large factions, as in the case of Monaghan or indeed the northern counties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, go to Liam next. Uh, Virginia, thank you very much. Um, you've managed to project Monaghan into European, contemporary Europe, and your contemporary European history, which is quite an achievement, I think. And thinking of Europe, I just wonder if the political stance taken by Monaghan Protestants and that kind of purism or exclusiveness in terms of representation is matched by, say, French Protestants, some examples of French Protestant areas or Italian Protestants. Thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, part of the answer is that, well, for Italian protests, the turning point is um, the rise of fascism, which targeted the Italian equivalent, or it's not quite the Italian equivalent, but it is um, the organization which provided some form of protection and connect connectivity among minorities in Italy, and that was the Freemasons. The Freemasons were the first to be targeted by fascists. Uh, more or less at the same time as the socialists and the trade unions. And it is interesting. In France, the response was similar. The, the French, the French uh, crisis came with the Vichy experience and the, the end of the Third Republic. And, and the turning point was the resistance, which in much of France was um, almost a sectarian divide between Catholics and Protestants. Um, such was the opposition, you know, the, the polarization of society in Vichy, in Vichy controlled areas. But of course, there is no French equivalent to the Orange Order. The exclusivism um, it was not an option when you are a tiny minority. So it is more a question of organizing your people in ways to maximize their effectiveness. I suppose the, 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 when you speak about minority, the threshold is between 10 and 15 percent. If you go above 15%, you have a section of society which has the power to fight back quite effectively. And then I would say um, effectively partition is, is a rational option. I mean, the alternative option, option is, of course, liberalism. That is, you focus on material issues um, along which you can build alliances which are non-sectarian. And that is, of course, what some of these voices were championing. Hi, Daniel. Just wondering how important um, issues around cultural nationalism and language are in differentiating differences between Protestants, because based on the names who are reoccurring here in terms of politics, so um, Christ, why, and so on, in a sense, language-wise, um, 
where it's presumably that you know you're looking at Orange and in Monaghan, you're going to have very different attitudes towards cultural issues. So it's running really quite sense it's a kind of explicit awareness of discussion of these. Uh, the divisiveness or a range of views around language and culture. So my impression, and again, this is anecdotal. In fact, it's more than I, in fact, I would argue that sectarianism is primarily a neighborly experience. And it depends on factors which I highly localized. The Irish state, Dublin, was non-sectarian in principle. But when it comes to winning elections, you have to please your electors, whatever they think. And they try to, to stand up to local prejudice in the case of the county mayor librarian, and eventually they lost. And this 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 sort of and the same happened with divorce, the same happened with the 1922 constitution and those sorts of other things. So democracy trumps the rule of law in just about every situation. And democracy depends on the on the forces on the ground. So ultimately, brutal force numbers counting the heads is what count what matters. And this is also why um, gerrymandering is so important because you can count the heads in various different ways. Having said so, at the level of cultural self-representation, language and these sort of things matter. But Douglas side, despite his social standing and all the rest of it, is dismissed by, for example, by um, the um, writer of um, the Irish Wrestling Magistrate, uh, Somerville, by Somerville as a fool in as many words. And she says, this is a fool who opens his house to anybody who speaks a language, whether he's a terrorist or, you know, uh, I'm a professor in the university, but he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Um, so effectively, it works only in some circles, perhaps in, in, in terms of projecting a certain cultural image also abroad, especially in the United States. It's not so significant um, when it comes to political political relations. It was very important for education, and it is it is highly prized by Archbishop Gregg, even when he was Bishop of Dublin. He said, when he said, oh, we are lost, we can't really compete with the, the Irish, you know, teaching of the Irish. He said, nonsense, we can have as, as, as good as anybody else. We have, you know, we storage of store of uh, Kelly speakers, we can organize ourselves. And to, to whoever says, Irish is a useless, useless language. I would answer, he says, if he, if he gives you a job in the civil service, it is not a useless language. So for him, there was this from the start, I mean, 1922, a clear strategy, which means let us play this game. Let us be as influential as we can within uh, the state, according to the rules of the game. But I don't really believe in them. And if I could choose, I would be in the British, you know, in the, in the Union as I was before 19. 1922, but here we are and we can't choose, we can't do otherwise. So let us make the best of it. Yes. Yeah, I don't think, um, I think, first of all, a number of questions with regard to obviously the presentation of Doyle. A lot of the fact that it's not there, and a lot of that is a reflection of being Emory than anything else. I think if you, someone was to do a survey of the, the Doyle and I met it at least one cause of. I'm currently you find it quite significant. I remember, uh, remember on the 270 when they saw the And I think that's accurate. Um, with regard to um, rap, rap, the Protestants, in many ways, the Orange men certainly, in many ways, shot themselves in the foot by refusing to. They recognized the state and they were inherently um, law abiding, but some of them refused to vote for people who had taken an oath of allegiance to. To the state, that, so that so they do, that's one of the reasons why they they, they they didn't actually vote as often. And uh, Seymour Crawford, who knew uh, when he got himself selected to go from he's a councillor first of all, he was going to the Doyle. First, he was he was in Newbis Orange Band, and he resigned from it. He resigned from the Orange Order. He resigned from Black Acceptance. He was able to do that to be elected, but it meant that uh, there was a undercurrent of uh, antipathy toward him, even amongst the amongst friends. He felt he should have stood up for himself. I mean, it shows that Protestant vote was still part of it. He could do that and still, still retain uh, the, the Protestant vote. Uh, I think that uh, 
the state continues and particularly in the authorities of the I would be amazed if membership of the loyal order being increased after the war. So many of the families, the young men, some were killed, of course, but a lot of them who weren't killed didn't come back, as is what happened after the First World War as well, of course, which decimated the Protestant population in many areas. Uh, other questions with regard to I, I was at Campbell College as a boarder in the late 1960s, made about 100 or 120 boarders out of about 500 or 400. So 25% of our boarders were from. 26 counties, and a lot of them would have told you that uh, their parents didn't want them learning Irish. It was a factor. That's Sir Richard Green. Does anybody remember him? He was, a, he was, a, and he, was, he had a research fellowship in the Institute of Irish Studies when I had one 40 years ago, and uh, he told me that this way. He had to go to New Zealand for work, and he, he never did Irish. He didn't do Irish because his parents sent him to uh, the senior center at Campbell College, I think. And the idea was that he would not learn that language. He said, of course, meant that he said he's, he's interested in Irish history and he couldn't he never teach. Yeah. Um, but the, the population is, is, is dropping to well below a sort of critical mass. There's no critical mass in the vast majority of, of places and where the Protestant community was strong and they're, they're drifting away and as they drift. Even those that stay, a lot of them do not, uh, uh, do not buy into the new church and they don't, go to the, they don't join the loyal orders. And uh, they, they sort of behave like Irishmen, um, but they, they do not uh, help to show, shore up the community. What helps in Dublin is uh, defections, um, a non subscribing church, and a non subscribing church in Dean's Green. And we have about 300 in that church, and of over, well over half of them are ex Catholics. Um, and that's simply because of the problems the Catholic community, the kind of Catholic church has been having. That's that's a sort of an exception, and you have to recognise the exceptions. But the, the but somebody else talked about education. And the cabin among the backbone, and almost all of the orange men are from small farms, 15, 20, 30, 50 acres. Um, it was the the, the landlords sent their sons to public school in England. Everybody else was educated at home, and they just were educated in the local primary school, which went to 14. With regard to Monaghan, Colonel Madden was, uh, and he was actually got the chairman for many years, I think, Monaghan kind of defense for the one of the rural councils. That's the Maddens from Hilton Park with Clovis. And uh, Colonel, Colonel Madden, uh, was on seven, and he was, he's the only landlord of any significance that, that I can remember when I was quite there. So just one or two bits of information. It is very useful, thank you. And I came across Martin in, in but in fact, it's the only name of uh, a landlord, land, you know, landowner, a large landowner I came across in the records. You are absolutely right. It is my impression as well. Democratic politics, going back to your wider point, involves compromises. And, and there is no question that you have to be ready to compromise if you want to win elections. That's it, that's a fact. And and um, and of course um, with with secular secularization, which is the other dimension, um, uh, the other dimension of uh, bear in mind that is fewer people going to church, fewer people living in small villages, people moving into large towns or moving abroad. With all these trends, traditional forms of uh, cohesion decline quite dramatically. Not just in Ireland. Wales is, is another great example. Uh, Scotland is another uh, obvious example. And of course, England and many other countries as well. So when you consider these various factors together and the nature of the political game, it's not surprising that the number of Protestant um, representatives decline. It's very interesting the Jews were better able in some cases to play the game. Um, but only in some cases, I would say, um, um, so I don't think we can generalize along denominational lines in terms of strategies and political vocations. Well, not the Jews, they, I don't want to get a small sample of the Jewish representative, but the Briscoes are there since the year dot, but people like um, Mervyn Taylor and come through legal routes to, um, and of course they're elected from other constituencies, yeah. which set them apart from. 
Good final points. Yeah, uh, one thing I like to say about I was playing playing in nineteen like the nineteen twenties. There was uh, it's not Protestant Catholic. You can see that it says Catholic and non-Catholic. So it all, somehow Jews and non denominational Christians are somehow added into non-Catholic groups. So, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, one thing I was going to ask you is, in your opinion. Do you think history is repeating itself in Northern Ireland? Like we'll see with the Orange Order at the moment, they're fighting against an NI protocol and its current election, which might be the first time ever Sinn Féin might have to be the first minister. So the large party installment. So looking at the last stand of one hand Orangemen, are we now starting to see the first of many last stands on Orange Order in Northern Ireland? In your opinion? Well, of course, this is only a political question, <laughs> and, this, and also the question about the future, which is not my period. Um, <laughs> uh, looking, looking back at the past 150 years, I would say a major defeat for orangeism and for unionists was not to accept home rule, and not to accept it, especially after uh, well, around 1914, when the nationalists would have been prepared to be in, to, to, to grant just about any conditions um, uh, uh, the Protestants would require. And of course, this undermined dramatically numbers in the South, the influence and prestige of the local gentry, cut off the South from uh, the British Treasury to a large extent, not completely, which meant land reform was much more punitive in the South than in the North because there was no money to fund it. And, and um, the withdrawal of the British Army was a huge blow. Not, and I don't look at the British Army in those days in Ireland as a military occupation. It was a major source of employment and major source of income because you had all these 30,000 or whatever number it was of young men in receipt of weekly wages and officers, all of them who need ways, ways to spend this money if you are in, in a clone or whatever. And a garrison of two or three thousand means a lot for locals, not to mention business for local farmers providing hay, horses, what have you, coopers, and yeah, I kind of just a microeconomy. And this was, of course, was the same in Scotland with the disbandment to the Scottish regiments. The Union would receive a blow the other way around in the case of Scotland. So, what I'm saying is that, yes, in my view, it was a big mistake not to accept Home Rule in 19. From a unionist point of view. And um, Paul Bure has argued that this would have been the first step inevitable towards independence because look at Scotland. I don't think so, for two reasons. <clears throat> Gareth Gerald said as much, for two main reasons. The first is the fear of communism from 1917. Of course, we're talking of counterfactuals. But let us suppose there was no 1916. And Ireland, they received Home Rule in 1914 or whenever before the Easter Rising. The Russian Revolution takes place. You find a block of bishops, Catholic and Protestant, hating the Russians more than anything else. And they will see the United Kingdom as the bulwark against communism. And this would have guaranteed Ireland in the Union for at least a century, at least 1990, the, the end of the Soviet Union. So this is one consideration. The other consideration is, of course, um, that the whole history of the United Kingdom would have been different with a larger farmer sector forcing Britain to make different choices in economic policy and many other things, which in turn would have benefited well, the interest of Irish farmers, among others, and Irish Protestant farmers in particular, probably sustaining the number in the Orange Order and many other you know, organizations as well. So at least uh, uh, an answer looking at the past rather than the future, and it is based on counterfactual. Easy to, I suppose, to contradict, but that is what I think. I think we could discuss that counterfactual <laughs> for several hours at yes. least, but however, our time is up. So, uh, Eugenio, thank you very much uh, you. for coming and for sharing your research. We really look forward to the book, which is not too far away. I hope so. No, um, on, on uh, the history of the Southern Protestant community. Um, I think just uh, it, it just uh, leaves. It's just left to me now to thank you formally on behalf of everyone and to ask everyone still here to give you a round of applause as a uh,